Well, it's good to be here this morning. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Praise God. Let's take our Bibles this morning and please turn with me to the Gospel of Luke, chapter number seven. It is good to be in North Carolina. Uh, I, I, my name is Pastor Peter Kariopoulos. I pastor in Montreal, Quebec, Canada. It's a long way from the Bible Belt. Uh, it's a Catholic area, very religious area, but uh, unfortunately, uh, the Catholic Church has made uh, all that's, uh, has turned a lot of people into atheists. And uh, we deal with, uh, with people who are hardened and uh, a lot of times don't even walk in, want to walk into a church, much less a church like ours. Our church is a King James Bible believing independent Baptist church. And I, I, you say, what would you be if you weren't a Baptist? I'd be ashamed of myself. And that's what I mean. <laughs> What would you be if you weren't a King James Bible believing independent? I'd be ashamed of myself. I, I, and and I'm glad that I'm glad this morning to be in a King James Bible believing independent Baptist. I guess that does make me family and friend to you. Uh, my last name's a little different. My background's a little different. Also good to see Brother Jack Lutrick. I haven't seen him in about maybe 16 or 17 years. His family came to uh, when I was pastoring in Digby, Nova Scotia, a small town that the Lord called us to for a little while, and I was there for about 10 years, and uh, the Lord was working there. Him and his family came, so it's, uh, it's a blessing to see how the Lord made our paths to cross again. Uh, but let's get into the message, Luke chapter number 7, and see what the Lord has for us, beginning in verse number 36. Amen. Y'all pray for us this morning. Pray for our church in Montreal. We got a good man there, Brother Mark Onofre, that's holding the fort. Pastor, Pastor Mark Onofre is our associate, and also Brother Luigi Bilucalia. Another uh, saved, saved Roman Catholics, one Portuguese, one Italian. Uh, they, they love God, amen, and uh, they, they, are, they are faithful men. And uh, we serve God together. We, uh, we started off together, just starting off. Our church got started. I'll tell you a little bit of the story, but our church got started. Really, it was a man from the Bible Belt, from Alabama, Pastor Larry Theophanopoulos. And he was a missionary to Greece for about, I think, 13 years and health reasons brought him back to the United States, and then the Lord brought him up to Montreal where he started a church, and I was at the first Bible study. I didn't know anything. No, I, I had never seen a Bible in my life till I was about maybe 18 or 19 years old. I'd never seen a Bible. I didn't know there was such a thing as a Bible. I didn't know there were 66 different books in the Bible. I thought it was all just Holy Bible. I, di I didn't know anything. I didn't know there was such a thing as a hymn book. Uh, but the first time I ever walked into a King James Bible believing independent Baptist church was in Vermont because there was no King James Bible believing independent Baptist church in our town. And so we'd, we'd have to go to Vermont every Sunday to go to church. And uh, uh, I knew right then and there, this is, this, is, this is where God is. And I had searched for it all my life. And I thank God that, uh, that the Lord has done that. You know, the Bible does say that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. It doesn't matter if you're in North Carolina. It doesn't matter if you're far from the Bible Belt. It doesn't matter where you are in this world. I truly believe that if you seek God, he will show himself. to you. So Luke chapter number 7, verse number 36. We're going to see this happen over here. It says, And one of the Pharisees desired him that he would eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and sat down to meet. And behold, a woman in the city, which was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment, and stood at his feet behind him weeping. She didn't even have enough, I mean, she, she didn't feel good enough to even stand in front of him. She was behind him. Amen. Stood at his feet behind him weeping and began to wash his feet with tears and did wipe them with the hairs of her head and, and kissed his feet and anointed them with the, with, with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee which had bidden him saw it, he spake within himself saying, This man, if he were a prophet, Talking about Jesus Christ. If this man, if he were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman this is that toucheth him, for she is a sinner. He says, she is a sinner. He didn't realize, I'm a sinner too, amen. Yeah. But he did say, she is a sinner. Verse 40, and Jesus answering said unto him, now the Bible says there in verse number 39 that the man said all that within himself. It says in verse 39 that he spake within himself. He was having thoughts inside his, in his mind and in his heart while all this was going on. He was speaking within himself. And the Lord, verse number 40, answers what the man's been thinking within himself. You know, that's something when God answers even what you're thinking. He knows what we're all thinking this morning. And that's a scary thought, amen? <laughs> but he knows everything about us. The Bible says that he's the only one who knows all the hearts of people. And he knows what you're thinking. He knows what I'm thinking, the good things and the bad things. And in verse number 40, it says, And Jesus answering said unto him, Simon, I have somewhat to say unto thee. And he saith, Master, say on. 
There was a certain creditor which had two debtors. The one owed 500 pence and the other 50. And when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. Amen. That's a good creditor there. He forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which, which of them will love him most? Simon answered and said, I suppose that he to whom he forgave most. And he said unto him, Thou hast rightly judged. And he turned to the woman and said unto Simon, Seest thou this woman? I entered into thine house. Thou gavest me no water for my feet, but she hath washed my feet with tears and wiped them with the hairs of her head. Thou gavest me no kiss, but this woman, since the time I came in, hath not ceased to kiss my feet. My head with oil thou didst not anoint, but this woman hath anointed my feet with ointment. Wherefore I say unto thee, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much, but to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. And he said unto her, Thy sins are forgiven. And they that sat at meat uh, with him began to say again within themselves, Who is this that forgiveth sins also? And verse 15, he said to the woman, Thy faith hath saved thee. Go in peace. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you, Lord, for your goodness this morning. We want to thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ, our blessed Savior. Bless the message and use it, Lord, to speak to our hearts. I pray, God, you show us what you want us to see, and I pray, God, you draw us closer to you. If there be any amongst us, Lord, this morning who do not know Jesus Christ, their Savior, I pray, God, they'd come to know him before it's eternally too late. And we ask it all now in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, the story here is going on in, in a Pharisee's house in verse number 36. This man who was a Pharisee desired that Jesus Christ would come and eat with him in his house. And he did. He went to the Pharisee's house. And, and, and the Bible says that while they were sitting there at meat, while they were eating, that a woman just kind of broke into the man's house. He came, she came in and, and she began to weep at the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ. And she, she wiped his feet with the hairs of her head, kissed his feet, and was weeping and anointed them with oil. And uh, as this was happening, the Bible says that this Pharisee said within himself that, you know, if, if this man was really a prophet, then he wouldn't let her touch him because she is a sinner. And as you know, by the end of the story, this woman, she found grace and she was forgiven of all her sins by the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Mm -hmm. Now, the Bible does say in John chapter 1 and verse number 17 that the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. The law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. When the Bible speaks of the law, it's referring to the commandments that were given to Moses up there on the Mount Sinai. And people usually refer to them as the Ten Commandments, but actually when you read your Bible, you'll find that there's a whole lot more than ten. There's hundreds of laws and statutes and judgments and commandments, all of which together make up the law of God. And that law of God is God's standard. It's God's perfection. It's what God put out there. as it. It's holy, the Bible says. It's perfect. It's his standard. And this Pharisee here, I believe in this story, in this, 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 in this text, this Pharisee, he's a picture of that law. The Pharisees were known for their strict observance of the law of Moses. And I know the Bible says that many of them were hypocrites, but the, the Bible also indicates that many of them were trying to sincerely uh, follow, uh, 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 to the best of their ability, um, the law of Moses. And he was there that day, and, and that Pharisee, he was, uh, uh, he was uh, uh, he's a picture of that law. But there wasn't only him at the table. There was also the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Bible says that the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. So you have the law, and then you have the grace of God sitting there at the same table. The Lord Jesus Christ, he's the grace of God. He's the mercy of God. He's the kindness of God. He's the forgiveness of God. I like that verse. The Bible says in one place that after the kindness of God toward man uh, uh, came uh, through, uh, it says the kindness of God. And I believe this morning that everybody who's saved is saved because God God was kind towards us, amen? Thank God we have a kind God, amen? And he's there, he represents, of course, the grace of God. He is the grace of God. And so here you have the law and you have grace seated side by side. And this woman came in who was a sinner. Notice that's who she went to. She did not go to the law, but she went to grace. Amen. She went to grace. And you, you know, you and I, we are like this woman. We are all sinners, my friend, here this morning. But are you going to go to the law to save you? Or are you going to go to grace to save you? If you want to get saved this morning, don't go to the law. The law cannot save you. But you've got to fall at the feet of grace. 
See, too many people are clinging to their religion. They're clinging to their uh, set of rules. They're clinging to their uh, whatever it is, their religion. They're climbing Jacob's ladder. They think, they think by these rules, I'm going to get in. By my works, by my religion, I'm going to get in and be a better person. But my friend, when the law looks at every one of us, it only has one thing to say. It says there in verse number 39, she is a sinner. That's all the law has to say about every one of us. There's only one thing that the law says when it looks at every one of us. Sinner, sinner, sinner. Every one of us, amen. The law has one thing to say about us. Never once does the law look at anybody and say, okay, he's righteous. When the law looks at every one of us, it only has one thing to say. Sinner, sinner, transgressor. Hey, the Bible says that sin is the transgression of the law. And I like what the Lord said there in verse number 43 of Luke chapter number 7. He says there at the end, thou hast rightly judged. <laughs> hey, 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 I mean, the law is not wrong. There's nothing wrong with the law. It's right. It gives us a true, ju- it's a real, it's, it's a true judgment of what we are. If you want to know really what you are in the eyes of God, go back and read the law and you'll see how many times that law says, must should be put to death, must be cut off, shall be, uh, you know, uh, put to death, stoned to death. I mean, when, when you look at, really want to see what you are in the eyes of God, my friend, you don't pick up some book written by some guru somewhere, some Dalai Lama or some Pope or who knows what. I mean, even when the Pope died, they had to offer prayers for him to come out of purgatory. Even the Pope's not going to heaven. Imagine that. What does that say about all the other Catholics? Amen. Are we all right this morning? I'm trying to help you a little bit. I'm trying to tell you that the law gives a true righteous judge. Thou hast rightly judged. The Lord, my friend, he said to the law, you're right. She is a sinner. Thou hast rightly judged, and my friend, when I, when I, when I measure myself by, by the standard of the law, when I measure myself by what, what I see in the Word of God, it's true. I'm a sinner, and God has rightly judged what I am. Amen. I'm a sinner. You're a sinner. The law is not wrong. It has rightly judged us all as sinners. We are all condemned under the law. We are all guilty of sin. But thank God there was not just the law at the table that day. There was somebody else at the table that day. There was the Lord Jesus Christ at the table that day. And he's the grace of God. He's the mercy of God. He's the love of God. He's the compassion of God. The Bible says the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. You know, when the law was given, it was given on tablets of stone. And they put those tablets in something called the Ark of the Covenant. And the Ark of the Covenant was placed in, a pla- in something called the holiest of all. Nobody was allowed to go in there except for the high priest only once a year. And the Bible says that he could not enter in without blood. He had to bring the blood of a lamb. And and you know, that law, the Bible says those tablets, they were put into that Ark of the Covenant. And on top of the the Ark, there was a, 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 it was covered with a lid called the mercy seat. And when God looked down from heaven and he looked down through that mercy seat, he saw the law. He saw the commandments. And in all the tribes of Israel that were surrounding that, in every person, in every family, in every man, woman, and child, he only saw a lawbreaker in every one of them. Everybody is a lawbreaker according to his commandment, according to his law. Every single one of us falls into that category of lawbreaker. But once a year, thank God, that high priest would bring in the blood of a lamb and he'd put it on that mercy seat. And so when God would look down from heaven, he didn't see the law anymore, but he saw the blood covering the law. And I'm fa- I, when, when, when God looks at me this morning, he doesn't see my sin. The blood is covered. God was looking, God gave us the law, the law was given, but grace and truth, God didn't just, if if all God did, if all God ever did was give us the law, forget it, we have no chance. But he didn't just give us the law. He knew that centuries later, the grace of God would come in the person of Jesus Christ, embodied in flesh and die on the cross and take upon himself all the sins of the world and mine and yours and 
God, so, that's why the Bible says that the high priest every once a, every year at the at the feast of of, of, of unleavened bread, you know, he would he would offer up the shoulder and, and the and the breast of the offering. He, he and the, he, the shoulder is where Christ carried the cross, and the breast is where he was pierced. And, and the Bible says that he would heave them and he would wave them and he would go like this and he would go like this. Amen. And God was looking down through the ages, and he knew that one day the grace of God was going to come and cover all our sins. Every single, my friend, we're guilty. We're guilty according to the law. We're guilty according to the law, but thank God grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 8, verse number 3 and 4 says, For what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned in the flesh. There's justice and there's compassion seated side by side. The justice of God must be satisfied because God is a just God and the Bible says that he must punish the transgressions. So, but also at the same time, God is good and God is gracious and God is merciful and compassionate and that's why he has a dilemma going on where he wants to forgive the sinner but sin must be punished and that's why both were satisfied at the cross, the justice of God and the grace of God because Christ took upon himself all the punishment that you and I deserve. He died as our substitute and now God, because his son paid for our sins he can have mercy on all the sinners amen I want to give you a few things here this morning the law could not do first of all I want you to see here that the law has no affection if you look at me in verse number 45 of Luke chapter number 7 notice what he says to the Pharisee thou gavest me no kiss <laughs> you know the law has no affection you know, the law only says one thing. The law says she's a sinner. Don't touch me. The law pushes away. Don't, don't touch me. Don't come near me. Stay away from me. The law has no grace, no compassion, no affection. You read through the law, and all it says is, shall be stoned. I, I, I'll never forget this. First time I got a hold of a Bible, and, and I believe in reading the Bible through, you know, from beginning to end. And uh, folks used to say to our pastor, you know, when they first got a Bible, and they said, okay, where do I start reading? He'd always say, start at the beginning. <laughs> And, and, you know, when I got through, uh, by the time I got through Exodus and Leviticus, my, my goodness, I, I should have been dead about a million times. <laughs> put to death, put to death, put to death, stone to death, shall be cut off. My, there's no grace and there's no, there's no affection in this. It's just judgment, 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 judgment. That's all it is. That, that's all the law says. She's a sinner. Don't touch me. But grace says, come unto me. Oh, he that, uh, that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And I don't believe he was just talking about laboring and being heavy laden because of the workload of the week and the days that they had to work to get ahead. He's talking about people who are laboring and heavy laden under the commandments and under the bondage of religion. That had, and, and of course the Pharisees had put extra commandments, man-made things. And so these people, they were under this bondage of religion and discouraged under it. And grace says, just come unto me. All ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. The law pushes away. The law has no compassion, but grace opens its arms. Whosoever will, whosoever will, let him come. Take of the water of life, really. I was raised Greek Orthodox. I was raised by immigrant parents. They came over from small villages, you know, in, in, in Greece, in the Peloponnesian area. And, and from a child, my, my, you know, my father, he was real abusive. He used to, you know, we, he used to beat my mom. He used to beat my brothers. He beat me a little bit. But, he did, you know, he didn't do it. I mean, it was abuse. It's what it was. And uh, that's all they knew from their parents and grandparents and and they came over here to Canada. They came over to Montreal, and they taught us the Greek Orthodox religion. My mother taught me to pray as a child. She taught me to pray in Greek. She taught me to and and for all those years growing up as a child, I'd kneel down every night and I'd say, "Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name." And then I'd go off in Greek, and I'd go off and I'd I'd repeat it in Greek and I'd say it in English every night. I'd pray those prayers. She taught me to pray to Mary, and that was our religion, and we were very loyal to it. 
It was a very self-righteous religion because it goes back centuries. It goes back to the Byzantine Empire and such. And it goes back to ancient times and to the Greek Revolution where they freed themselves from the, uh, from the Ottoman Empire and from the Turks. And, 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 and you know, they, they, they just, they make themselves, you know, they, they attach the religion to the culture and the nationality so much so that if you would somehow question it or break away from it, I mean, you're, you're, you're questioning your entire culture and everything you're raised in from a child. It's Greek dancing, it's Greek uh, culture, it's Greek food, it's Greek school, it's Greek this, Greek that, everything. And so when you question that religion, and you're kind of breaking away from all of it altogether. But you know what I found out after a while? There's no, there's no affection in it. It's nothing, but, it's nothing but a bunch of rules. It's nothing but a bunch of set, a, a set of rules. Do this. Kiss the image. Kiss the picture. We'd walk into church and there'd be a picture there of some saint or a picture of what was supposed to be Mary. And you're supposed to, first thing you do, you, you cross yourself and, and, you, and you go and you kiss the picture and then you move on. And you know, the Bible strictly forbids that. And you know, we knew that, but we did it anyway. And, and, you know, we'd look at that, and, and the, the way the light would glare off that picture, all you saw is lip marks, or lipstick everywhere. And I'm like, it's disgusting, you know. And so I'd kind of go up there, and I'd kiss it on the little corner there. And then I'd go over there where the, the priest sells you a, 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 a candle for about a dollar, and he lights the candle for you, and, and that's supposed to be one of your prayers. And so I'd go there, and I'd buy a little candle. I'm just talking about a young teenage boy, young boy, and, and I'd get a candle, and, I, and, and we'd light it. The, can, the priest would light it, and he'd put it in the sandbox thing, and after about five minutes, he'd take it, and he'd dip it in water and put it out and resell it. And I'd think to myself, man, he just erased my prayer, you know. Kissing pictures, lighting candles, crossing yourself, never saw a Bible, never heard anything I understood, had no understanding. There's this guy with a long beard and all this bling bling in front of him, you know, and, and at the end you just go, you take a sip of wine, a piece of bread, you go home, you did your duty, you went to church. That's all it was, was just dead religion. There's no affection in it at all. And, and you know, we'd fast, you know, every, every year before Easter time, we'd have 40 days of fasting where you didn't have any uh, meat or any uh, dairy. But, and, and I never understood why. None of that made sense to me. You know, we'd gain weight during our fasting, you know. <laughs> and I never understood why during our fasting you could eat the olives, but you can't have olive oil. That never made sense to me. Why can we eat the olives, but we can't have the olive oil? You know, who comes up with all these rules? And of course, you just, just don't question it. Just do it. That's what the church tells you to do and so on. But there's no affection in it. There's no affection in the law. It's just a set of rules and that's it that somebody gave you. But there's no affection. There's no kiss of God on it at all. And the second thing I want you to see here is that there's no cleansing in it. If you look at verse number 44, it says, And he turned to the woman and said unto Simon, Seest thou this woman I entered into thine house? Thou gavest me no water for my feet. You know what the law does not do? It doesn't give you any cleansing. No water, no cleansing, amen? There's no cleansing. And I, I was a pretty good kid growing up. But, you know, I went to school and I got good grades. And I wanted to go to a, a good private school that my mother got me into. And then, you know, I found out she didn't have the money to, uh, uh, to, to put me in the school. My parents had divorced by this time. It was pretty messy. It was pretty bad. And, uh, you know, but, but after a while, I got into the, with the wrong crowd in the neighborhood I was living in. And so introduced to the drug scene from a very young age maybe 13, 14 years old, already introduced to the drug scene. And, you know, at first starts all what they call the soft stuff, you know. But back then in the 80s, they always said, you know, this is your brain and this is your brain on drugs. And they'd show you that frying pan on television. Nowadays, they're saying it's good for you. They legalized it. Now they give you safe drugs, you know. But back in those days, it was like, now in those, back in those days, it was like, drugs are bad and don't touch drugs. But we got into drugs just to fit in with the crowd. At first, it was the soft stuff. Then after a while, people start asking where they can get it. So I start getting it. I start selling it. Next thing I realize, you know, before long, I realize I could do this myself. I become a drug dealer. I mean, just because I knew the people who wanted to buy it and I knew the people who were selling it so I you know eliminated the middleman and I became the guy and the next thing you know I'm selling drugs and making money as a teenager acid drugs PCP mescaline all of that stuff making money I mean just a 16 17 year old kid I was high all the time 
I was high all the time. I wasn't getting high to get high. I was getting high just to be functioning normal. Just to where you can, you know, kind of get through the day. I mean, I was high all the time. I needed it all the time. I, I, I began to, 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 you know, people, the word started going around. And next thing you know, I'm making money and I'm selling this stuff to kids and to other people in the neighborhood and at school. And I thought I was too smart that I was going to beat the system and nobody would ever catch me. Till one day, man, I got caught. I got caught. They found something on me. I thought I didn't have any. They found it. The police came, arrested me, and I had to go and tell my mother about it as a 17-year-old kid. My mother, she worked so hard as a single mom to try to raise us up to get a good education so that we can have a good life. And it was, it was probably the worst, one of the worst days of my life when I had to sit down and tell my mom that, you know, of what had happened. And I saw her bury her face into her hands in disappointment, and I felt so small. Thinking that you're so cool and then you realize, you know, you're not, it, it, this is not cool. You're, you're, you're an idiot. You know, we have several people, I'll give you a little, we have several people in our church who are converted from a mafia life. Several people in our church who are converted from a mafia life. And, and, and even till this day, they always deal in the back of, they're always work. When a visitor comes to church, who's this guy? <laughs> Their, their back is to the wall. Some of them cannot drive in the middle lane of the road. They have to be always on the right or the left because they have to make an, it's still ingrained in them. Every time they see a police officer, every time they see a stranger, they live in constant, you know, their conscience is just affected so much. And, you know, you think that this is big, strong, uh, fearless people. But I'll tell you this, they're not fearless. They're full of fear. That life puts you in a, in a condition where you are full of fear. I thought to myself, okay, that's it. No more of this. Uh, I'm going to change my life, and I'm going to become a better person. So what did I do? I went back to my church, and I went all the time, and I prayed those prayers, and I went back to the church, and I lit the candles, and I kissed the pictures, and I said, okay, my religion. Uh, and, you know, it didn't work. I mean, for a little while, they would kind of clean me up, but then I'd go back to my old ways. Then we got to where we were renting an apartment and people would come to the apartment and they'd buy dope from us in the apartment. We saw Haitian gangs come in and, and steal dope from our friends who, were also, who also had other apartments like that in the area because we knew a lot of people. And they'd come in and they'd steal their dope or they'd steal their money. And, and you, know, uh, you know, I have friends that had to get into knife fights over, over trying to protect their dope or uh, trying to protect their money. They called me Pitchfork Peter for a reason, because when I'd answer the door, I had a pitchfork. <laughs> I was always afraid. I was living in fear. I'd see somebody knock at the door, and I'd have my pitchfork. I'd see a police car go by, and I was always afraid. I was always worried that something was going to happen, and now, you know, uh, that something, uh, you know, that I was going to get caught again or sent to prison or who knows what, but I was at the bottom. No joy, no peace. I mean, in a, in a small apartment by myself, no furniture in there, just waiting for people to come and buy dope. And I'm sitting there all by myself. And what in the world has become of me? I'm just a 18 years old, 18 years old. Out with a bunch of friends one night, going out, getting wasted, getting, do getting doped up. And we were, we, we were coming back to the car from the forest we were in, and we saw about seven guys coming towards us. And right away we thought, okay, this is going to be trouble. We're getting ready to have a fight here in the middle of the night under the street lamp in this area. But to my surprise, they didn't say, they didn't want to get into a fight. One of them said, hey guys, we want to talk to you about the Lord Jesus Christ. It was a French church called La Bible Parle, which means the Bible speaks, and it does. <laughs> And my initial response was, you know, I got nervous, I got scared. I said, I don't know who these guys are. You know, I said, I'm a Christian and I have my religion. And one of them looked at me and said, do you really have your religion and are you truly a Christian? And I said, yeah, I do. He said, well, do you believe in heaven and hell? And I said, yes. And he said, well, then where are you going? Couldn't answer the question, but I knew right then and there something inside me told me, I'm going to hell when I die. I told my friend, I said, I think we're pretty good. We must be going to heaven. My friend was honest with me. He said, Peter, if we died right now the way we are, we're all going to hell. Don't you realize that? 
sat down with another friend of mine one day getting wasted and sitting down by a water where we, were, where we used to go and, and hang around for a while. And I said to him, I said, Kevin, I said, do you believe in, in hell? And he said, I, I don't know. I said, well, I want to make sure of one thing. I want to make sure that I don't go there. I don't want to go there. I heard a preacher one day. He was on television of all places. <laughs> preacher on TV. And this preacher on TV, he said, you can be born again. And another thing about this preacher on TV, it was one of the evenings I had nothing to do. I said, I might as well listen. You know, this guy, he already sowed a seed in my mind about where you're going when you die. I listened to this preacher, and he started preaching, and he started saying, you can be born again. And he also said this. He said, you can know for sure you're going to heaven when you die. Another thing he said was he would always talk about Jesus. Jesus, Jesus. The name Jesus just kind of, every time he would say Jesus, it was like a megaphone in my mind and in my conscience. Because in the religion I was raised in, they had a big, big painting of Mary. And Jesus was this little baby. And in my mind, Mary was the strong one and Jesus was the little one and, and she had to protect him. And you know how they reason around that? They say, well, she's the compassionate one. And if you want to, you know, it's like if you want to talk to somebody and get a hold of their, if you want to get some mercy, you got to go talk to his mother. Because she's, she's gracious and merciful. And, you know, Jesus and God, they're angry. They're mean. They're angry with you all the time. So you got to talk to his mother so his mother can soften their heart for you, whatever. That's, that's how they reasoned around that. But they didn't have a mother like mine. <laughs> My mother was strict and she was tough. And she came from the old country. She came out of World War II. She saw the Germans marching in her village. And, and then after that, the Civil War. I mean, she, she came from a, a rough and hard background. And she, she, was not, she, she was not this, you know, soft person that, you, that they imagined. I mean, they, she was not, they didn't have a mother like mine. Whoever told you that story? But that night, I knew something was going to change. I went into my bedroom and I prayed differently. I didn't say our Father which art in heaven. I prayed differently. I prayed to Jesus. I don't remember exactly all that happened in transfer, but something changed from that night. Because I prayed in my mind to Jesus my Savior. We had a little children's Bible and all it had in it was pictures and, and Bible stories for children. And that's all I could find. We didn't have a Bible. That's all we had. And I started reading it and it began to speak to me. It really did. It began to speak to me. The first thing I remember reading is the Sermon on the Mount, in particular the verse that says, except your righteousness exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall in no wise enter the kingdom of heaven. And when I read that and all the other, king and all the other things in the Sermon on the Mount, I said, there's no way I'm getting in. I will never live up to this. But I wrote to that preacher on television, and they sent me a track. And the track had in it the gospel. And it had that picture of the sinner on one side. And God on the other side. And the gap in the middle. And the cross in between that bridges the sinner to God. And they said if you want to be saved. It's going to be by the grace of God. And not by your works. And not by your religion. And you got to believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God. And then they said here's a prayer you can pray. And knelt down to the best way I knew how. By faith I prayed. I got up. And then it said now that you have received Christ. This is what happened. You now possess everlasting life. I said, what? I said, look at this. It said, look at this. John 3.16 says, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Now, whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. They said, you got everlasting life. I said, what? That's it? I looked outside the window and everything was different. I felt clean on the inside. Never been the same. God God did something in my heart I never got over. You know what my life, you know what? There's no cleansing in the law. There's no water. He said, you didn't give me water to clean up. But you know what? That, that day, my life began to change. I didn't have the temptations for cigarettes and drugs. And I, and not a, a, I had a large, large collection of heavy metal. Heavy metal, that rotten heavy metal. And after a while, I, I didn't, didn't like it anymore. 
And I began to throw it out a little bit at a time until I got rid of all of it. And I got away from the old crowd and I had no more friends anymore. And I was just by myself with my Bible in my room. I, I mean, this children's Bible trying to pray, seek God. I knew that I didn't want that life. And something changed inside me. Something that the world could never give me. Something that religion could never give me. I want you to see there's no cleansing in the law. And thirdly, there's no power in the law. Because it says also in Luke chapter number 7, watch this, verse 46. My head with oil thou didst not anoint. But this woman hath anointed my feet with... You know what that oil is? It's a picture of the Holy Spirit. And the Bible says that the Holy Ghost... The Holy Ghost is in you when you're saved. You are baptized by the Holy Ghost. You are sealed by the Holy Ghost. Something changed inside me. You know the world just gives you a temporary feeling. But when that, when that feeling wears off, you go back to feeling empty. And emptier than you did before. I started, you know, something happened inside me. I started getting filled with joy. I started getting filled with joy. I mean, there's no, there's no power in the law. And there's no change of heart in the law. Back up to verse 42, it says, And when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. That's the credit of forgiving the debtors. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him most? How about that? The debtor loves the creditor. Why would the debtor love the creditor? Because he's forgiven. <laughs> you don't love the people you owe money to, let's be honest, Amen. <laughs> I mean, nobody loves the person you owe money. Nobody loves their, the creditor. But when the creditor says you're forgiven, then something changes in the heart. Which one will love him most? And you know what happened, my friend? There was a change in my heart. I wanted to go to church. I wanted to love God. We were going to Vermont every Sunday. I won't bore you with the details, but that's how I ended up in, in church in Vermont in a small town where there was a King James Bible-believing independent Baptist preacher. I prayed and I asked God to show me the truth and guide me in the right direction. I didn't know anything that was, I didn't know anything about, I didn't know the name Baptist. Never heard it in my life. I was brought to the King James Bible-believing independent Baptist church. Sat in the back. I didn't know what to say. I didn't know how to act. I didn't know when was to stand and sit. In the Greek Orthodox church, a bell goes off once in a while. You stand. Cross yourself three times. The bell goes off. You sit down again. You do that for about an hour until it's over. You go about three times a year, you did your duty. That's it. Nothing more. But it is torture to sit in that thing for an hour at a time, an hour at a time. Some guy slinging incense all over the place, you know, and, you know, that's all he's doing. You, you know. But when I sat in that church for the first time and I heard people singing hymns and I saw the pastor shaking hands, going around, he knew the people by name. In my mind, the priest was always some guy that lived in the back, some room somewhere. Nobody knew him. No one, he was kind of like, he was, he was, he was far beyond any, you know, what, we, what we were. And, and, and he was of another class altogether. But this pastor, he came out and he, was, he shook my hand. And he preached his message that morning and I heard it twice. I heard it the first time it came off the pulpit. It bounced off the wall behind me. And I heard it the second time as it was going back towards the front. Everybody had a Bible. Somebody put a Bible in my hand. I wanted to be there. I, I, and God, God was good. And, and, and I met my wife, Mary. Amen. God's been good to me. I went to church. I had no job. I had nothing. I was just a dope addict. I had nothing. I tried boxing, you know, to get out of, the, you know, trying to change my life. Maybe I'll get into boxing, you know. That didn't work either. That messed me up even more, you know. But I went to church with nothing. I needed a lift. I didn't have a Bible. I didn't have a job. I didn't have money to put in the plate. I had nothing. Somebody picked me up. A total stranger that I met through somebody else picked me up outside my front door and drove me one hour to Vermont so I can go and sit in a church for the first time in my life. And I was hooked right away. The next week he came, his sister was in the car. Amen. How about that? She's my wife now. Amen. <laughs> But I'm I started feeling this bubbling up inside me every time we'd sing, every time we'd worship. And, and something else started happening. I couldn't help but shout. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, amen. I, I couldn't help but get happy. And I couldn't get, yeah. raise my hands and say amen. And then I found out you can enjoy God. You don't have to endure God. You can enjoy God. Amen. When our church started for our pastor, he started our church not long after that. And I got there. I had to get a taxi cab, walked in the rain, did whatever I could. But I wanted to be there. My heart was in it. I wanted to serve God. Serving God became a joy. But then after that, oh man, the opposition. 
family. I'm the youngest of three brothers. You joined a cult. Just like we heard this morning in Sunday school. Oh, you joined a cult. You went to church. You're going again. And you went this morning. It was a Sunday morning. You went this morning. And you're going again tonight? And then Wednesday night, you're going again. When you start going to church Wednesday night, that's it, man. You've lost it. <laughs> then they're like, you're, you're, you're nuts, you know. So I wanted to be there. Loved it. Loved being in the house of God. Loved the preaching of God's word. Loved the word of God. Amen. That's what the Bible says. Which one will love him most? When the, 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 the debtor begins to love the creditor. Because he's forgiven. Amen. Change a heart. Change of heart. Well, oh, man, that opposition. You know, like we heard this morning in Sunday school, we got a lady in our church battling that right now. She's Roman Catholic, got saved, her, her daughter, her son, and her husband is threatening to call the police on our church because we are recruiting people, we are a cult. You know what I say to that? Amen. We, we're, we're, we're trying to cultivate something. It's agriculture. Amen. <laughs> we're trying to grow something for God. Amen. Hey, listen, listen, listen. <laughs> it's a call. We're, we're trying to, it's agriculture. We're cultivating something, amen? I never, I never went to a youth camp. I never saw, I never went to a camp meeting. All we had was a small little group meeting somewhere, renting a building. Our pastor would set up a stack of song books and preach off of that. We, we had nothing but a handful of people. There wasn't all this life that you get to enjoy in your church. I mean, it was just a handful of us that were saved out of a Roman Catholic or Greek Orthodox background. But, we, man, we were on fire. I was on fire. You could not contain the fire that was in me. And I'd never been to a youth camp or a camp meeting or saw these great preachers and great music groups. And, but, and I wonder, my friend, nowadays, if I could just kind of take a step aside and just mention, how is it that you can have all that and not be on fire? When's it going to be enough to get you on fire? Change of heart. I'll give you one more thing. The law has no change of heart. The law has no salvation. Look at me in verse 48. Look at me in verse 48 here. Watch this. And he said unto her, Thy sins are forgiven. And they that sat at meat with him began to say within themselves, Who is this that forgiveth sins also? And he said to the woman, Thy faith hath saved thee. Go in peace. The peace of God. The peace of God came into my heart for the first time in my life. I had peace. I had joy. And I didn't need those things. And I didn't want them anymore. Still don't want them. No desire any of that. I, I, the peace of God and the joy of God came by being, by, look at this, by being forgiven. Verse 48, you, you find the word forgiven. Verse 50, you find the word saved. You know what it means to be saved? It means to have all your sins forgiven. Amen. Listen, my friend, you can go to the law a million times and it will keep saying, you're a sinner. You're a sinner. You're a sinner. You're guilty. But you go to grace one time. Yeah. Forgiven. The law is holy, but there's only one problem. None of us can keep it. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. To be a sinner does not mean to be an extremely bad person next to you. you know, it's not that. It means to come short of the standard. Even if, you, even if you think you're a little bit short of the standard, whether you're in the 50 pence or 500 pence category, it doesn't matter. You are still short of the standard. If you're, if you're a kid in college and, like, you know, my daughter, she's going through college, and, some, you know, to, it's pass or fail. Whether you get 30% or 59%, it's pass or fail. There's no such thing as being really bad or not so bad. And in the eyes of God, it's, it's, it's 100%. That's what he expects. One, his passing grade is 100%. You can't make it on 99%. None of us can attain the 100% perfection. But Jesus Christ did it. Which is why God in his mercy, he sent Jesus Christ to offer himself on the cross and to be the perfect sacrifice for our sins. My friend, we don't need religion. We need a savior. Those Pharisees, like many people today, they misunderstood the law of God. They thought the law of God makes you a good person. They thought the law of God makes them righteous. The opposite is true. The law shows you that you're a sinner. It's actually called the ministry of condemnation. Verse 39 says, she is a sinner. 
The law condemns every one of us to be uh, as unrighteous. But, but, but look at what you get in Jesus. You get forgiveness. The law condemns, but grace forgives. You know, there's a story in the Bible when Moses went up on the mountain and he got the law. God wrote it out on tablets of stone. And he came down off that mountain and he saw the children of Israel worshiping a golden calf. And that law says, thou shalt have no other gods before me, and thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. And according to the law in his hand, those people were condemned under this law. And you know what he did? Broke those tablets. In his mind, it was his way of kind of freeing them from it. And you know what the Bible says about the Lord Jesus Christ when he went to the cross? It says, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to, to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. When Christ died on that cross, all the condemnation of the law is removed from me because he took it for me. But if I refuse to receive Christ, then the condemnation of the law falls on me. But if I receive Christ, he takes the condemnation from me, and he took it for me, and I receive his forgiveness. Forgiven. Look, it says in verse 47, look at this carefully, I'm just about done. Wherefore I say unto thee, her sins, look at this, which are many. Many are forgiven. Many sins are forgiven. You know what grace can do? It can forgive all our sins. John chapter 3 verse 18 says, He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. John 3 36, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. There's only one thing I want to leave you with here this morning. And it's found in Ezekiel chapter 18. And for sake of time, we won't turn there. But there's a verse in the Bible there in Ezekiel 18 where God says, the, the children say the, the, the parents have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. And he says, you will not have occasion to use this proverb against me in Israel. You cannot make excuses. You cannot say, my father did this and now I'm like this. Look, I had an abusive father. I came from a broken home. It's no excuse. It's no excuse. I'm here to take away your excuses this morning. If you're not saved, you have no excuse. If you're not in church, you have no excuse. If I get to church, you know, from a place far away from the Bible Belt and drive to Vermont an hour every Sunday so I can get to church and sit in church and have no revivals and no choir, no piano player. And all we had was preaching. And all we wanted was the Bible. And it was enough to keep us there. It was enough to keep us going back just to hear somebody open the Bible and preach it to us. We didn't need all this extra stuff. What excuse do we have? There is no excuse. The Lord is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. There is nothing said about this woman's background. We don't know if she came from a broken home, if her mother was a drug addict. I mean, there's nothing said there. The Lord didn't say, you know, the law just says she's a sinner. And the Lord didn't say, yeah, but you don't know her background, you know. He didn't say, you don't know who her mama was and who her daddy was and who her background. He didn't say, he made no excuse. He said, you're right, she's a sinner. And in the law of God, according to the law of God, it doesn't matter what our background is. We cannot use it as an excuse. Every single one of us, yes, we are sinners and sinners without excuse. And our excuse is removed from us this morning because God did not just give us the law, but he sent his son to save us. There's no difference between you and me this morning. We're both sinners. I'm a forgiven sinner. I'm a forgiven sinner. That's what the Bible says. Thy faith hath saved thee. Thy sins are forgiven. When you call yourself a sinner, you're acknowledging that the law is true. It is. That's why I know I'm a sinner, because God's law is true and it's right. Under the law, I'm a sinner, but I'm forgiven by the grace of God. Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us. By grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, 
lest any man should boast. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God, the gift of God, the gift of God, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. God's been good to me. God saved me. God's, God, I, 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 I surrendered my heart one day in my bedroom, said, God, here am I, send me. Now here I am, a preacher of the gospel. After all these years being in the ministry, having a beautiful wife and three children and, and seeing all of them in church and all of, none of them messed up, thank God, and all of them serving God. And my daughter just got married to a young man who's serving God. My, my son is serving God. My youngest son wants to be, and, and my wife and I have a great relationship. And she's Greek too, amen? That, that, that's just an extra bonus right there. Beautiful Greek wife, amen? Made three beautiful Greek children, but they're all sinners, amen? How do I know they're sinners? They came from me. <laughs> but they got saved and they're in church. And we're, we, I'm just, God's been good to me. I get to pastor a great church, see God work in my life. I walked into church with nothing. God pulled me out of a place where I was sitting there looking around with a pitchfork, waiting for somebody to come and hurt me. Scared, fearful of the police and gangs and all that. And God pulled me out of there. And here I am today to give God the glory. God's been good. God's been good. If you're not saved this morning, my friend, you know what you ought to do? You know what, if I, if I were you, if I wasn't saved, you know what I'd do? I'd get saved. Yes, sir. If you're not saved, why don't you get saved? Amen. Preacher, why don't you come? Let's all stand this morning. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Jack's going to come give us a good song. This morning you heard one of not only the greatest testimonies you'll ever hear, but you heard one of the most clearest, simplest, plainest presentations of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ you'll ever hear. Your good works will not save you. Your church membership will not save you. That law just doesn't have any affection in it. That law just keeps beating you saying, do it, do, do, do. Grace says, it's done, it's done, it's done. We're not inviting you this morning to come join the church. We're inviting you this morning to come have your sins forgiven and come to Christ. Push you by your heads just for a moment while these pray. And let me ask you a real serious question while you stand there. You say, Preacher, what that preacher said was right. And this morning I'm lost. If I was to die in the shape I'm in right now, just like he said about himself all those years ago, if I was to die in the shape I'm in right now, I ain't going to lie about it. I know I'd go to hell. That's me. Would you pray for me, preacher? Would you slip your hand up right there where you're at if you'd like for me to pray for you? Just slip your hand up and slip it back down so I can see it while nobody's looking but me and God. Pray for me, preacher. Would there be one like that? God bless you, sir. God bless you, young man. Would there be another one that join these two? Not sure I'm saved. God bless you, ma'am. Would there be another one? I want you all to listen to me. I'm going to pray for you. But me praying for you won't save any of you. Just like he bowed his knee, bowed his head, trusted Jesus Christ. You're going to have to make that same decision this morning. I'm going to pray right now. And I wish that you would move and come to Jesus. We'll have somebody meet you down here with a Bible and show you how to be saved. Father, I pray even now as they're about to sing. That somebody that's raised their hand and maybe some that haven't would respond to the call of the gospel this morning. Oh, Lord, this law won't cleanse them. It won't save them. But this preacher told them about Jesus that if they'll just come by faith, you can save them by your grace. God, I pray you give them faith to believe this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.